Okay, so are there any other questions about the review sheet? Does anybody have any other questions? Awesome. No. <laughs> That's okay. Good questions. Okay, so remember that your midterm exam is next Monday, right? Halloween. So the last topic that we are going to go over before the midterm is the digestive system. So this is chapter 23 in your book. And um, when we're looking at the digestive system, there's an overview um, in your book that talks about um, what happens at each specific area of the digestive system. And so this is kind of a nice diagram to look at when you're um, thinking about um, reviewing the digestive system and then maybe also writing um, your um, essay question that's related to that. That's in chapter 22? Chapter 23. Oh. Okay, so we're going to start in the oral cavity. So the, the process of taking food in is referred to as ingestion. So to ingest is to take food in. And we have some accessory glands that are associated with the oral cavity, which are the salivary glands. And they play a really important role in that they moisten the food. They also contain enzymes. So for example, there's an enzyme that is referred to as salivary amylase. And so remember, whenever we see this ACE ending, when we're talking about the digestive system, this means that it is an enzyme. So salivary amylase specifically breaks starch down into a disaccharide called maltose. And so that is the enzymatic reaction that takes place. And this enzymatic reaction is called hydrolysis. So it's called enzymatic hydrolysis. So the enzymes that we have in our digestive system require water. And one of the reasons is, is that the water molecule is actually broken and then it attaches to the um, pieces of the molecule that have been separated. And so water is required for um, breaking down food um, substances in our body. So what? I did reset record, yeah. So if you look at starch, starch actually isn't very sweet. And so sometimes you take in things like uh, crackers and the, or bread, and it's not very sweet to begin with. But you can hold it in your mouth for a little while, and then it'll start to taste sweet. And that's because we have some chemical digestion that is taking place in the oral cavity. So this is an example of chemical digestion. because we're breaking the molecules apart. But we also have mechanical digestion. So in the oral cavity, we have um, teeth and a tongue. And so this is chewing is called mastication. So this is chewing the food. And the tongue plays a role in this because it manipulates the food. And it's kind of amazing when you think about it because as you're chewing the food, your tongue kind of goes underneath your teeth and darts back out, right? And so it's actually more, it's more amazing that we don't bite our tongue more often than we do because of the way that we chew and process the food, okay? So this is an example of mechanical digestion. And mechanical digestion is breaking down a substance so that the enzymes have a greater surface area over which they can bind to the substrate. So this increases the surface area where enzymes can bind to the substrate to break it apart. So like for example, if you chewed a cracker um, the uh, chemical um, digestion would take place much more quickly and you taste sweet, sweet much more faster than if you just let it sit in your mouth um, until you tasted um, the sweetness, right? And so this is why they say you need to chew your food well 
because um, sometimes the food can get all the way through the digestive tract without actually being um, digested and the nutrients um, taken out, okay? So if we look at the tongue, the tongue has another role, right? And the tongue is composed of skeletal muscle. And um, it has um, the ability to um, contract against itself to make the tongue either thin or thick, right? So it can um, change shape, the tongue can. So it's kind of an interesting skeletal muscle. So it has like extrinsic contraction, right? And this moves the tongue around, so it moves the tongue out and back in. Maybe extends. Hello, right? But we also have intrinsic contraction, which makes the tongue thicker. Right. So as a muscle, it's kind of interesting because it has these two different types of contractions that are taking place all the time that allow you not only to chew your food, but also to make sound, right? So the tongue plays an important role in mastication, but it also is um, important in language. And then it also is important in taste. So we talked about taste buds and the different tastes, the five different tastes that we have. Um, there's taste buds on the surface of the tongue and these are sensory because they can bind to chemicals that are in solution and then they send it, right, that signal to the brain so we have the sensation of taste, which is gustatory sens 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 sensation, if you remember when we talked about the senses, okay? So if we look at the structure in your book, this is a diagram that shows the accessory glands. And so we have a big one up here, which is called the parotid gland. And the parotid gland sometimes gets infected um, and specifically virus, the virus that causes mumps, causes this to become infected. And so that's why people who have mumps have a swollen face, right? So it looks like they have like their little chipmunks because their face is so swollen because of the parotid gland. And then we also have glands that are sub um, mandibular. And so sometimes your glands can, you can feel them when you rub your thumb like underneath your jaw, your mandible, right? And those um, um, sometimes, sometimes can become sore. We also have um, lymph nodes under, located underneath there. And then we have um, the um, salivary gland that's sublingual. So you need to know the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual um, glands. And these are all examples of exocrine glands. So if we look at the sal uh, saliva, this is excretory, or it's produced by by excretory glands, and they're secreted into the oral cavity via ducts. So there's a duct, right? And so that when you know when you're in high school or middle school, people would gleek, right? <laughs> that is saliva shooting out and from underneath the tongue, right? So you can track some muscles and that can cause the, um, the saliva to shoot out. And so notice also here, this kind of interesting, there's a duct from the parotid gland that comes up to the back of the mouth. So there's actually saliva being added um, from the back of the mouth as well. Okay. So if we look at saliva, I mentioned that there's enzymes, but there's also antibodies. Does anybody remember what type of immunoglobulin is found in saliva? We talked about immunoglobulins or antibodies. So it's one of the Ig, right? It is A, right? And I kind of remember this because glands produce IgA. So like the mammary gland also produces IgA antibodies. So these protect against infection. And then we also have lysozymes. So lysozyme enzyme, this is an enzyme that breaks down bacteria. Right. 
So the saliva has a antimicrobial um, uh, uh, action, right? And so when you lick a wound, you know, when cats lick their wounds, or even I would if I cut myself, the first thing I do is I put it in my mouth, right? And that actually helps because you actually have chemicals in there that will break down the bacteria, okay, in your um, saliva. Okay. So if we look at the tongue, remember that we talked about at the very back of the tongue, we have a tonsil. And so that was called the lingual tonsil. And so um, that can get swollen up right, when you have an infection. So these are your palatine tonsils back here. And then at the very back, we have a, uh, some taste buds right here. And then we have taste buds along the surface of the skin. We also have papilla. Um, you don't need to know the, the different papilla, but we also have um, filiform papilla, which aren't like the buds, but these actually um, allow us to grip stuff with our tongue. So if you think about food and chewing, these are actually create friction on the surface of the tongue. And some people, it's kind of interesting, I forgot to make a picture of this, but some people have really interesting tongues. Like they have like, like crevices and cracks that run through their tongue, right? And that's because of the filiform, um, the, the way that the filiform or that friction um, uh, little structure um, um, is on the tongue. Okay. So dentition, teeth are interesting. We actually have two sets, right? So the first set, which is sometimes referred to as the milk teeth, these are the ones that come in first and they are deciduous. Does anybody know what deciduous means? Like if you're talking about a deciduous tree, deciduous trees versus evergreens do wet with their leaves shed them, right? So these are lost. Right? So the deciduous milk teeth are lost. And then we have um, the permanent adult teeth. So when we look at our dentition compared to other am animals, we are omnivores, which means that we eat plants, and animals. So what this means is, is that we have teeth that are kind of able to um, use um, and, and digest, mechanically digest all different kinds of foods. So what kinds of um, teeth do you think are involved in clipping? Does anybody know? So like if you were thinking about a horse um, that clips grass or other vegetable matter, what are the teeth that are called that clip? They're also our front teeth. Does anybody know what those are called? These are called incisors, right? So these are involved in clipping action. We also have canines, which are involved in ripping. So if you think about the difference between trying to eat a carrot versus trying to eat a piece of beef jerky. You know, if you tried to like rip a piece of beef jerky off using your front teeth, that would be very difficult, right? So ripping is the side. So if you put a piece of beef jerky, you generally use these teeth right here, which are our canines, okay? And then we have molars. We actually have premolars and regular molars, but molars are for grinding, right? So after we have um, eaten something, we, off we will oftentimes grind it underneath the molars. Okay. Now, if we look at the structure of the teeth, the outer part of the tooth is composed of an acellular uh, chemical that is called um, um, enamel. And interestingly, this is the most kind of the hardest thing that we have in our body, hardest substance in the body. It's harder than bone, right? And so that's the outer protective layer of the um, tooth. And then we have um, an inner layer, which is composed of dentin. And dentin is organic, right? And it's like bone. So it's bone-like. And then coming up into the tooth, we have the root, right? So the root contains blood vessels and nerves and lymphatic vessels, but blood vessels and nerves, 
right? So we actually have lots of sensation in our teeth. So if you just kind of close your eyes and you can actually kind of sense the teeth in your um, mouth, right? So we have pressure, we have temperature, right? I can kind of feel the way that they press against one another. Okay. And that's because we do have nerves that run up. And so when you have a root canal, right, they go in and they destroy that nerve. Right, and they destroy the blood vessels and they generally replace it with a dead um, cap, right? It's just a cap that they put onto the tooth. So if we look at a diagram that shows this, right? Here's the teeth. So the molars would be in back, the canines are like right here, and then the incisors are in the front. And then it also, this diagram is kind of cool because it shows these openings to the salivary glands, right? That mandibular duct. And we also have a, um, a thing that holds our tongue to the bottom of our um, mouth, which is called the frenulum. And then we also have a piece of um, tissue that also holds our lips to the gums, which are also called frenulums. Okay. We're gonna talk about gums in a minute. So these are the deciduous teeth, right? That's the bottom. And then it tells you when they come in, in this diagram. And then this would be an example of uh, the permanent teeth, right? So obviously we have more, I think what, 32, is that right? Permanent teeth. And so the really interesting thing about these um, deciduous teeth is actually they are present. Um, and they're in the bone of your mandibles and your maxilla. And so when they come in, they actually are just pressing and pushing the other teeth out of the way. So they are actually already in the bone and ready to erupt. Okay, so this just shows enamel, then it shows the edentin, right? And then it shows the um, nervous tissue and the blood vessels coming up into the tooth. And then we have the gums. And so to hold the teeth into the uh, mandible, we have what is called a ligament, which is called the periodontal ligament. And so sometimes you get um, an infection in the gums that can damage that ligament. So you get what is called, uh, what is it called, periodontal, periodontal disease. Right. And so this is infection in the gums. Or the gingiva. Like gingivitis is bad breath. So gingiva, which is also the complex name for the gums. Okay, so we get an infection in the gums. And so why is that so bad? Like if I get like anything like they actually measure my gums and if they look at even red or swollen they get all freaked out so why do you think they get why does your dentist get all freaked out especially when you get older like seriously they're like we got to do something i see that your gums are swollen what are we going to do and so what are they why are they worried Does anybody know? nope but good guess <laughs> They're worried that it's going to cause cardiovascular disease because they have this, they have linked periodontal disease with heart disease, right? And so if they get, my gums get infected, it can actually get into my circulatory system. The bacteria can get into my circulatory system and then I can get atherosclerosis and I can get strokes and I can have heart attacks, right? And so that's why they freak out when you get older and you have um, swollen gums is, is that they're worried about your heart, right? So this affects the cardiovascular system. Affects. And so they make you take antibiotics, which is kind of a pain for that. Okay, so those are the teeth. So that is the oral cavity. Now, when we look at the mouth, right, we can see that um, 
we it is directly connected to that common tube right that um, connects to the respiratory system so they don't have it labeled here but this back of the throat area oh they do is the pharynx right so the pharynx and so food goes from the oral cavity to the pharynx and then we want it to go to the esophagus instead of the trachea and so remember that it could go i'll just put a little line here to the trachea and that's when we get choking right but there's something that prevents that from going there and that is called the epiglottis so i'm going to put the epiglottis right there epiglottis and so when we chew we want to swallow a bolus of food. And this is important because remember that the epiglottis is actually a mechanical valve. And so we want to chew and then we want to swallow a bunch of food together. And that food together is called a bolus. And the bolus is actually what uh, pushes on the esophagus and closes off that part of the trachea. So if we look at a diagram, oops, where's my diagram? Right here. Okay, so this is my bolus of food right here, right? This is my epiglottis. So notice, remember that the trachea is anterior, the esophagus is posterior. So notice this is a great diagram because it shows that bolus pushing down on the epiglottis and closing off the opening, which is called the glottis. And then the food goes into the esophagus. Okay, so after the, um, after the um, oral cavity comes what is referred to as the alimentary canal. And so the alimentary canal goes from the esophagus to the anus. And it has a common histology which means that it is the tissues are arranged similarly down the entire length of your digestive system. So when we look at the innermost layer, this is called the mucosa. So this is the innermost layer. So what that means that this is closest to the lumen. So the lumen is the space where the food is. Okay, so a lumen is the opening it's the, generally the inside of an organ, okay? So mucosa, think that this produces mucus, right? So this is the production of mucus. It is epithelial, and does anybody remember? In the esophagus, it's stratified, right? But in the stomach, it's actually simple. But this is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue lines the inside of and the outside of organs and actually also makes up glands, right? So our salivary glands actually derive from epithelial tissue. Okay, so the mucus protects the digestive tract. So we talked about the mucus in the respiratory system as like... Um, functioning to capture debris, for example, but in the digestive tract, it protects against the digestive traction because it reduces friction and it prevents acid and enzymes from or destroying the tissue or damaging the tissue. So that's the mucosa, the innermost layer. So in your book, they show um, a diagram that shows just um, a typical part of this digestive system. So this would be right here. This is what is referred to as the lumen is the space, right? And then we have the mucosa right here, okay? and the mucosa, the innermost lining, and notice how there's glands associated with that. And then we have what is called, called the submucosa. So we have the submucosa.
And this has connective tissue. So this is underneath the mucosa. So this has connective tissue. And it also contains um, blood vessels and nerves. And so we talked about the enteric nervous system. And so the enteric nervous system is um, the part of the nervous system that is associated with the digestive gland. And so it would be underneath the mucosa and the submucosa. So you can see here the blood vessels and the nerves, right? Then we have um, the part which is composed of um, muscular tissue. And so this would be this part right here. So this is muscle tissue. And that's called the um, muscularis externae. Now, what type of muscle do you think it is? Cardiac smooth or skeletal? What kind of muscle do you think it is? Nope, good guess though. <laughs> it is smooth. So the smooth muscle has two layers. So it has a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. And the circle, circular and longitudinal layers allow for a type of contraction which is called peristalsis. So these allow for So peristalsis is the alternating relaxation and contraction, which moves substances through the digestive system in one direction. So sometimes we vomit, however, right? And stuff moves the other way. And that is a um, protective reflexive um, response coordinated, I think, by the, I think that's the medulla oblongata, which causes us to regurgitate the food and goes in the wrong direction. If there's toxins present, that if they are absorbed, they could do damage to the body, right? But generally, we want the food to go in one direction through the digestive system. And so those layers um, in the um, circular and longitudinal circular is going to actually, if I drew my circular right here, this is actually going to press in this direction, right? And it's actually going to make the lumen smaller, right? And then if I'm pressing in this direction along the length of the digestive system, then it's actually going to make the digestive system wider, right? So circular constricts. And then if I'm like shortening it, right, and if I'm pushing on it from the top and the bottom, that is actually going to make it um, bigger, right? So that's, this is going to cause, circular is going to cause a constriction. And longitudinal is going to increase the diameter. I would say maybe this is increased diameter. Okay, and then the final layer is connective tissue. And so it is called the visceral peritoneum. And so um, it also has another name called the serosa. So the serosa is equal to the visceral peritoneum. And we've seen um, that all of our organs sit in a cavity, right? And so this is part of the peritoneal membrane that encloses our body cavity, okay? So the serosa, I'm gonna write it up here, which shows it right here, this outermost layer right here, after we get from the longitudinal and the circular, the serosa or the peritoneum, so I'll just put 
peritoneal cavity. Okay. This is the space where the digestive organs sit. And there's two layers to the membrane. So just like when we were talking about the pericardium and we were talking about the pleural cavity, right? There's two layers. So we have the um, outer layer, um, which is called the parietal peritoneum. So this is the outer and it's attached to the body wall. And then we have the visceral peritoneum. which is inner, right, and it's attached to the organs. Now there's another structure that we have in our digestive system, which is kind of interesting when we, we're gonna do the dissection of the fetal pig today, or not today, but this week in lab. And you see that there are connective tissues that are called mesenteries. Right? And so this is connective tissue that contains blood, lymphatic, and nerve vessels. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Okay. So these mesenteries are also shown here because coming in, how do we get? So if you think about our body cavity, we have all these organs suspended in this space. So how do we get blood supply to the organ? The blood has to travel via a mesentery. And the mesentery is connective tissue that's connected to that outer visceral um, peritoneum. And then the blood vessels and the nerve vessels can actually enter into the organs. Okay, so we can carry um, oxygen and nutrients and we can signal them with um, neurotransmitters for the digestive system to do something like contract. Okay, so if we look at a diagram that shows that, it looks like this. Okay, so this is my abdominal cavity, right? It's actually filled with fluid. We have the visceral peritoneum right here and then we have the parietal peritoneum right here and then connecting these, right, to the body wall and to the blood vessels would be the mesenteries. And so you can see that these are mesenteries, um, connective tissue that allows blood vessels to be, um, to transport substance, okay? Okay. Okay, so let's look at the esophagus. So the esophagus, um, is um, an organ that is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. And so when we ever we see stratified, that means it friction, right? So when we swallow food, if you've ever swallowed um, like a sharp chip or something or sharp food, you know, you can feel it going down the esophagus and it's very painful, right? And it can maybe do a little bit of damage, but because the esophagus has stratified squamous epithelial, generally does not cause bleeding, okay? When we look at um, the esophagus, we also see that it is um, um, under involuntary control or involuntary involuntary muscle contractions. Right. So sometimes you can feel these and they can be really annoying. So let's say you swallow a pill and it gets stuck in your throat and you're like, oh, I can feel it in my throat. And you can almost kind of feel the sensation of the esophagus contracting because the esophagus would be trying to force the pill down and the pill stuck onto this side of the esophagus and you can feel that, right? And so those are the involuntary muscle contractions. And this functions to carry the food to the stomach. Okay. 
Now, once it's in the stomach, um, it's going to get mixed with acid. And so we need a mechanism to prevent acid from getting back up into the esophagus. And so we have what is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. So a sphincter is an enlargement of the circular muscle and it closes it off, right? So this is what functions to prevent acid from the stomach from getting up into the esophagus. Prevents acid from stomach, um, uh, prevents acid from stomach entering the esophagus. That's a little, um, the esophagus. Okay, so if we look at the structure of the gastroesophageal sphincter, it is actually formed um, by the diaphragm. So we learned how the diaphragm separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities, right? So the esophagus has to actually go through the diaphragm. So it pierces the diaphragm and the diaphragm is a muscle. So it actually helps to form this valve. Okay. So if we look at a, um, a diagram of that um, gastroesophageal region, so gastro means stomach, esophagus, right? So if we look at a diagram, this shows um, the, um, it being closed. This is the food, right? This is the involuntary muscle contractions pushing the bolus to the esop, or excuse me, the diaphragm kind of sits right here. So the stomach is under the, underneath the diaphragm, and then that diaphragm helps to um, keep the stomach acid from getting into the esophagus. So does anybody know what it is called when you um, have a piece of your stomach actually above the diaphragm? It's a type of hernia, hiatal hernia, okay? So you can get what is called a hiatal hernia. And this can be from um, pressing too much on the abdominal, like um, contracting your abdominal muscles can sometimes force the stomach above the diaphragm. And also when, you have, when you're pregnant, um, babies can actually press on the stomach so that it kind of extends up above, right? So there's things that can cause this hiatal hernia. So this is where the stomach protrudes above the diaphragm. And so this means that the sphincter does not work as well. And so this specifically leads to what they call GERD, what? which is gastroesophageal reflex disorder, right? So gastroesophageal esophageal reflux, so acid reflux disorder. Okay, so GERD. Okay. He had esophageal cancer, mm -hmm. so they took out most of his esophagus and had his stomach up, and then he just listened, so he got a hernia, and then it was up. Right. So this actually is, the reason why this is so bad is, is that the acid, right, the acid in the stomach can damage the esophagus and can actually lead to cancer. So that's what they're mainly concerned about. And so you get what is called esophageal cancer. So this kind of runs in my family. And this hiatal hernia can actually, sometimes it can be a sliding hernia. So sometimes the stomach is above, sometimes it is below. So it can kind of move, right? And the way they diagnose this is by doing an endoscopy. So this is where they stick a camera down the mouth. And then they go down into your esophagus and they can go down and into the stomach. So they go kind of from the oral cavity to the stomach using an endoscopy. It's different from the other end, right? It's called a colonoscopy, but right, that's the di large digestive system, okay? 
And so what they're looking for is if there has been damage to the esophagus and then they can take a biopsy and then they can see whether or not the, there's precancerous cells. And so generally the way that they can treat this is, is they give you acid reducers first, which I kind of learned um, since I have a high hernia and I took acid reducers when I went to Costa Rica this last summer, I got really sick, right? From the bacteria in the food and the water. And the p other people in my family did not. And so my theory, oh, my hypothesis, sorry. My hypothesis is, is that because I was on acid reducers, that I was more likely to get infections from the food and the water, right? Because the acid was not killing the bacteria. And so it was making me sicker than it was making everybody else in my family. So you can do acid reducers. They can also do a surgery where they try to pull the stomach back down and then they kind of wrap some muscle around there and um, try to prevent it from sliding back up into the thoracic um, body cavity. Okay. So this is a diagram that shows that, uh, so this is the stomach, right? This is the hiatal hernia. So this is your diaphragm. This isn't, isn't in your book, it's just online. And then this would be acid producing glands right here. And then it can easily see, easily get into the esophagus. Okay, stomach. The stomach is a really interesting organ because we actually do not need it for survival, except for the, it produces one thing that we cannot survive without. And does anybody know with that one chemical, it's a chemical that we've actually already talked about a little bit. Stomach produces intrinsic factor. And this is needed for vitamin, oops, vitamin B12 absorption. So if you do not have enough vitamin B12, what do you get? Where did we talk about this before? Anemia, and specifically what type of anemia? Does anybody remember? It's the pernicious anemia. Okay, pernicious anemia. Okay, that means it just persists, I think. So, and there's probably a different definition for pernicious, but. Okay, so that's pernicious anemia. So this is really the only reason why we have to have a stomach, okay? But the stomach is useful in other realms. And one of the things that it does is it stores food. So we have the storage of food and water. Because the stomach, because it has those folds, which were called rugae, um, the stomach can expand. So it can expand up to two liters. Okay. And so what this does is this allows us to eat like one or two or maybe three large meals a day. We don't have to eat all the time, right? So we can actually store food. We can eat one big meal and then we can go do something else, right? We don't have to eat continuously, okay? And so this is um, the reason why in some people, they reduce the storage capacity of the stomach by a couple of means. It used to be that they would actually go in and they would staple the stomach, right? That reduces the storage capacity. And now they have what are called these little lap belts. So they go in and they belt the stomach so that they make it artificially smaller so that people cannot eat huge amounts of food, right? And so that is a treatment for obesity is to reduce the storage capacity of the stomach. Sometimes they actually even do a bypass where they'll actually take the esophagus and kind of bypass most of the stomach so that the food goes directly um, almost to the, to the small intestine. Okay, so you have a stomach bypass or stomach stapling or lap belts put in. Okay, so that's one of the main functions. We also have mechanical digestion. And so this is the churning of the food. Mechanical digestion. 
And so again, the, the um, stomach is also a smooth muscle. And we, when we mix food plus gastric juice, we get what is called chyme. So food plus gastric juice is called chyme. And then we have chemical digestion. So what type of acid do we have in our stomach? Hydrochloric, excellent. And so we have HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. And if you have lots of hydrochloric acid in your stomach, this protects you against infection, as I mentioned before, because we take in lots of bacteria, lots of fungi, right, that could actually cause problems in our bodies. And so this is protective, the hydrochloric acid. When we eat something, it, it immediately um, kills off the microorganisms. So I'll put kills microbes. Right. It also denatures proteins. So it starts to unfold the proteins. We talked about protein denaturation. Right? And the other thing that it does is it helps to break down the connective tissue of in the food, right? So let's say we eat a steak. Right? So a steak. So that connective tissue can be broken down so that we can get access to the proteins. So there is also a um, enzyme that is released into the stomach that is first released in its inactive state. And this enzyme is called pepsinogen. So this is inactive. And then in the presence of hydrochloric acid, so I'll put HCl here, it turns into pepsin which is active okay. and pepsin breaks the peptide bonds between amino acids and so this is um, functions in protein digestion so remember that proteins are composed of amino acids that are bound to one another and the, the bond between those amino acids is called a peptide bond. So that might be a way that you can remember pepsin digest proteins. So if you don't have a lot of um, acid in your stomach, um, then it becomes much harder to digest um, meat, for example. So meat might be, make it really, it might be really hard to digest steak or something like that if you take a lot of acid reducers. Okay. So that's the chemical digestion. So if we look at the gastric glands, these also produce mucus. And the cells that produce mucus are called what? We learned this last week in lab. Goblet cells. So this is produced by goblet cells. And as I mentioned before, this mucus protects the stomach from digestion. Right? So it's important to protect the stomach from digestion. We also have um, cheap cells in our gastric glands. And these are what produce pepsinogen. And then the parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid. And then we have one more group of cells that produce um, hormones, which are called the enteroendocrine cells. And these produce hormones. So um, those hormones help to regulate digestion. Also, we talked about how um, serotonin can actually be produced by the digestive tract, and so those can produce serotonin, which is kind of a hormone, but also a neurotransmitter. So if we look at a diagram that shows the stomach, okay, here's my stomach. Remember, it still has those layers. So we have the mucosa, it lines it. We have the submucosa, then we have the 
um, layers, muscularia externa, and then we have the outer part, the serosa, right? And if we look at the stomach, you notice that it has folding, right? So it can actually um, expand or contract, right? And in some organisms like, um, like uh, reptiles, like snakes, it can expand dramatically, right? When after a meal, their whole digestive system actually gets larger to deal with that meal, right? But they might only eat once a month, right? So we have the ability to um, eat large meals and then go for long periods of time without those meals. Okay. And then if we look at the gastric glands, these are little pits in the stomach, right? pits in the stomach, and they have inside of them parietal cells producing hydrochloric acid, chief cells producing pepsinogen, and then mucus cells or goblet cells producing the mucus, and then the enteroendocrine cells, which are producing the hormones. So those are gastric pits. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about that right now. I'm gonna show you a video. And so this video, I love this video because it takes you inside the digestive system and specifically talks about absorption of nutrients, which we're gonna talk about on Wednesday. And um, also um, what happens when acid and other things get past the mucous membrane and can cause gastric ulcers. So let's just see if I can do this in the dark. And then leave the light on. Sorry, I have to turn the light on. I need a I didn't have my guess down there. It's impossible to see. Okay. So before I forget, remember we're having a quiz, our last quiz before the midterm on Wednesday. And it'll be over this information that we went over today, as well as what we went over last week, which was the end of the respiratory system. The human body manages this is to convert everything we eat into a few basic components instant and storable energy vitamins nutrients and waste in a process never to be discussed at the dinner table here's what happens after we chow down the first stage of digestion is simple moistened by the saliva of the mouth muscle contractions move the food down the gullet toward the stomach here whatever we've taken in will be turned into something more manageable although it doesn't look it the stomach is a muscle a smooth muscle it flexes over and over again slowly squeezing whatever we've eaten into pulp depending on the food this process can take up to several hours while enzymes help break the food apart, industrial strength acid surges in from a thousand tiny jet streams along the stomach wall. A closer look reveals the microscopic gland that manufacture more than three quarts of gastric juice a day. It's a powerful food, mostly made up of hydrochloric acid a substance that can turn metal to mush. What keeps the gastric juice from heating the stomach itself? The answer lies in the shining reflections on the surface. They are part of the mucous membrane. A thin protective layer that 
that not even hydrochloric acid can penetrate. Salt, alcohol, and certain other foods can, and too much of any of them may result in an ulcer. The burn marks on this stomach wall show what the acid can do if the protection of the mucus is stripped away. While stomach ulcers have most often been blamed on diet and stress, recent studies indicate certain bacteria can also be the culprits. A healthy stomach can break down just about anything we serve it up. I'm actually lucky that I'm not too regimented. I'm not too picky about what I eat. Being an athlete, you do try to like to get a lot of carbohydrates in, so, you know, some pastas, but I also grew up um, being under uh, meat and potatoes type person. So, you know, I like my meat and potatoes. I'm not a real big vegetable eater, um, but I do have something green every day. And, you know, whether I chase that with milk or whether it's a salad, which I enjoy, <laughs> and that's okay. But sometimes I have to chase those vegetables with milk. <laughs> I like to snack on chips and um, probably like candy bars, like Snickers or something like that, ice cream. So I love chocolate chip cookies. Of I actually probably like the dough better than the actual cookies, but those are my favorites. It might not sound all that healthy, but then you can come back with yogurt and that's better. If you think Bonnie's diet sounds good, be prepared to train as hard as she does to burn it all off. Thoroughly massaged, the sandwich is passed down the disassembly line to the duodenum, the top of the small intestine. Here, it gets a rinse as intestinal juice, pancreatic juice, and the bile are all added. A dirty looking bile is really a cleanser, manufactured by the liver and shot in from the gallbladder. It breaks large globules of fat into fine digestible droplets and helps pancreatic juices neutralize acids from the stomach. The gallbladder concentrates and stores the bile until it is needed. If the concentration gets too great and is made up of too much cholesterol, gallstones can result. These are gallstones, old bits of cholesterol, bile salts, and pigments that rolled around together until they collected into little balls. They're not a real problem until they get stuck in the bile duct. Then, until they pass, they become the source of excruciating pain and usually a resolution to eat less fat. By the time our meal reaches the small intestine, it has been turned to soup. From here, useful nutrients will be taken up by the body. Our muscle contractions draw the fiber, other undigested substances, and water into the large intestine. The journey through the large intestine can take up to 12 hours. Needed fluids and water are removed, along with most of the bile that was added. The bile that remains accounts for the brown color of human waste. These are bacteria feasting on our food remains. These helpful microbes produce vitamins and consume leftover nutrients and oxygen causing intestinal gas in the process. Under regular conditions, 25% of human waste is made up of these friendly bacteria. The process of the body taking what it needs from the food we eat is called absorption. This takes place here, back in the small intestine where the body soaks up the good stuff for distribution. But bacteria are also present in the small intestine. How does the body absorb nutrients while screening out the bacteria that could be dangerous in other parts of the body? These tiny finger-like projections that line the small intestine walls are called villi. Like a super absorbent rag mop with filter attached, the villi are able to soak up the nutrients and leave the bacteria behind. Here's how it works. On the top, each villus finger are six-sided cells, one ten thousandth of a millimeter across. The bacteria are too big to fit between these tightly knit fibers, but glucose and other nutrients easily slip through. 
Here at the cell surface, tiny greenish fat globules float right in. Enzymes, here looking like red jelly beans, turn complex sugars into simple sugars. It can be pulled into the cell through openings in the cell membrane, seen here as cups on the cell surface. Now it's on to the bloodstream. Some of the sugar goes directly to the muscles, but that can only power us for brief spurts. The rest needs to be stored for when we need it. Bonnie's snack is now being put to use. Her sandwich, the yogurt, and a few crispy tortilla chips have been broken down. The high octane fuel pulled from them, glucose, powers her every stride. But it takes more than raw fuel to make a champion. Okay, so messed up there. Okay. So that was the stomach. You saw the stomach and its contractions and its mucous membrane. And I wanted to talk a little bit about gastric ulcers. So we'll watch the rest of that video on Wednesday. Okay. So if we look at gastric ulcers, these can also be visualized by looking using the camera during an endoscopy so they can stick a camera down in your stomach to see if you have gastric ulcers. One idea was it was a due to excessive acid, right? So too much acid in the stomach and that could be due to your diet. So if you eat stuff that has to um, be broken down with the hydrochloric acid, um, perhaps um, that could lead to um, an ulcer. The other idea was is that um, it could be also due to stress. So stress might make it more likely that you um, uh, produce gastric ulcers. But recently what they have discovered is, is that there is a, a type of, of bacteria which is called Heliobacter pylori. So this would be right up here. Okay, so Heliobacter pylori is H. pylori. Has anybody ever heard of that? Does somebody say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, H. pylori. So H. pylori is a bacteria that can live in the acidic part of the stomach. And when they first proposed that gastric ulcers could be due to bacteria, they were like, no way, right? They were like, that is just a ridiculous idea because the pH of the stomach is so acidic, it should kill off the bacteria. And so the microbiologists that first uh, uh, put up that hypothesis actually ingested um, H. pylori bacteria and then got ulcers, right? He actually experimented on himself. And then he took antibiotics and he got rid of the ulcers. And so he kind of was the first person to like prove that a bacterial infection can, uh, yes, indeed, lead to gastric ulcers. So if you go and, and the doctor says, oh, you just need to reduce your stress, and your diet, and then if you change some of those things and you still have um, um, ulcers, you need to ask for this as a test, right? So they can actually do this, it's a breath test. They can actually have you breathe and then they can test for the H. pylori. And you don't want this really because one of the problems is it's very resistant to antibiotics. And so you might have to take like six months worth of antibiotics to get over this. And so it's like a real pain in the butt to get over once you get the H. pylori. And it's believed that you can actually also, you can have it, but in some people it doesn't have an effect on them, right? So it could be that you have it, but it is not causing you ulcers, but it could be present in your body, okay? Um, also, some other things that get across the mucous membrane include salt, aspirin, not sate, salt, salt, aspirin, and alcohol, right? So when you take aspirin, you know that that causes, they say it causes your stomach to bleed a little bit each time. It's because when it's absorbed across the surface of the stomach, it um, dissolves that mucous membrane. And salt and alcohol, they also do the same thing. So like the really, the worst thing you can do um, is to come home from work or school, right? And on an empty stomach, eat potato chips, take an aspirin for your headache, right? And drink a beer. <laughs> That'd be like the very worst thing for your stomach, right? So they say that if you're gonna consume alcohol, you should always eat 
first, right? Because that helps to protect the lining of the stomach so it doesn't <laughs> cause excessive bleeding, right? It also slows down the absorption of the alcohol across the stomach so you're not going to get as intoxicated as quickly, right, when you eat something with your alcohol. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to, we'll come back to that. We're going to move on to the small intestine. So the small intestine is only small because it has a small diameter, right, versus the large intestine, which has a large diameter. It is not small in its surface area or its length. So it's actually longer and has more surface area than the large intestine. Now, the valve that um, is between the stomach and the small intestine is called the pyloric valve. And the pyloric valve is really important um, because this is a sphincter muscle, just like the gastroesophageal sphincter, just like the anus is also a sphincter. This sphincter allows for a small amount of time to enter the intestine, small intestine at a, at a given time period. Allows for a small amount of chyme to pass from the stomach. We wouldn't want to just open it up because um, the small intestine is not as resistant to the acid. So it, it actually kind of shoots it, squirts it. So it kind of like opens up and squirts a little bit of chyme into the small intestine and then it closes back up and then it squirts a little bit more. So it's a, it's a small amount. And um, this prevents too much acidity in the small intestine. So we also have pancreatic juices that enter the first part of the small intestine. And these pancreatic juices, we're gonna talk about the pancreas in detail, but these contain enzymes and they also contain a pH buffer and they're alkaline. So an alkaline buffer, right, which decreases the acidity of the chyme. We also have bile. And so bile is a, is a type of um, substance that is produced by the liver. And is stored in the gallbladder. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing between chemical and mechanical digestion because this is responsible for, I'll be done in like uh, seven minutes, responsible for the um, mechanical digestion. of lipids okay so we sometimes say it is a detergent it's like a detergent and it is a emulsification or a emulsifier emulsifier right so what this bile does is it takes large fat globules and it turns it into, with the addition of bile, small fat droplets. So this is like, if you think about when you're cleaning a really greasy pan and you just try to do it with water alone. So let's say that you like, you, um, you roasted like uh, pork or you roasted uh, um, meat, right? And you have all that grease in the pan and just trying to rinse that off, right? It doesn't come off, right? It sticks. And so then you add a drop of detergent and then all of a sudden it starts to break up, the, all that grease will start to break up and it'll break up into smaller pieces, right? So it's the same idea here. So the small fat droplets have an increased surface area and there's an enzyme that will bind to them to break them up 
So lipase is the enzyme. So lipase binds and breaks up the lipid. And so this is chemical digestion. So lipase is an enzyme, that ACE enzyme, this is actually from the pancreas, comes in from the pancreas, and it binds to the lipid molecules and it will break them down so that you can absorb them across the surface of your small intestine, okay? But bile is a chemical, but it's responsible for mechanical digestion, okay? So that's it's a little bit confusing. So if we look at that first part of the small intestine, this is called, and we'll talk about this um, on Wednesday, this is called the duodenum. And the duodenum is really important because that's where everything is added to the small intestine from the pancreas and from the gallbladder. So they're showing the gallbladder here. This is the bile duct. It kind of merges with the pancreatic duct and then it releases enzymes and bile in this first part. And that um, aids in um, breaking down and um, decreasing the acidity of the chyme. Okay, so we'll stop there for today. And then we'll talk more about absorption, nutrient absorption, on Wednesday.